thought you were talking about him. Uh, good evening, everybody, and welcome to this meeting of the Cabinet. Um, and a bit of housekeeping. We're not expecting a fire alarm, but should the alarm sound, please proceed down the stairs and out of the main entrance and gather in the car park next to the library. Please ensure all mobile phones and electronic devices are on silent. Please note that we are trialling hybrid meeting arrangements with officers and councillors who are not members of the Cabinet, having the option to join the meeting via Zoom and are also live streaming this meeting via the Council's YouTube channel to encourage more people to engage in our public meetings. The proceedings of the meeting will also be recorded. Please can I remind everyone to use their microphones when speaking and turn them off when finished. Please can attendees present uh, present in person, refrain from watching the live stream or joining the Zoom link as this will cause interference for our viewers. Anyone attending the meeting remotely must use their raise hand function when they wish to speak and to declare any interests at the appropriate time. As this is a trial, if anyone attending the meeting remotely loses connection, the meeting will continue and they will have the option to follow the meeting via the YouTube live stream. Just for information, any members of the public who are attending or viewing specifically for item 12, Torquay Down, uh, Town Deal Land Assembly, it is anticipated that this item will be considered in private. Lisa, any apologies? No, uh, sorry, Chairman, apologies from Councillor Steve Darling. Thank you. Um, I will move as a correct record the minutes of the Cabinet on 27th September 2022. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Long. Do, Mr. Chairman, yes, thank you. All those in favour? Unanimous, Chair. Disclosure of interests. If any member has a pecuniary or non pecuniary interest, please raise your hand. Your virtual room has, has nobody's indication in your virtual room either, Chairman. Thank you, Lisa. Um, we might now move on to item four, and I'm pleased to welcome Martin Harris from the Unleashed Theatre, who is going to give us an update and presentation on the exciting project uh, in Abbey Road. Over to you, Martin. Thank you, Darren. Thank you very much. Hello. Yes, my name is Martin Harris. I'm from Unleashed the number of homeless uh, people on the streets literally spiked and so I started a drama group in Leonard Stocks um, homeless centre and uh, just to help people get back on you know get some self-respect and have a bit of fun and you know help them with uh, interview skills walking into a room holding their head up high that sort of thing Sh a lady from Shrublands um, she sat in on one of those drama workshops and we um, got funding to actually expand it and we moved into Endeavour House which is run by Shekinah who also run um, the homeless centre. So we, so 2014 since then we've been running every week, 51 weeks of the year, a drama workshop for people who are on the fringes of society, a lot of them homeless, a lot of them ex-homeless, a lot of the recovery community, people with really um, profound mental health issues, uh, people who have additional needs and it's a wonderful wonderful um wonderful community um over the years we've expanded uh, in 2016 we did our very first under one roof you've got a little goodie bag with lots of stuff in that in that you will find the um the program from under one roof three which we did last uh, on sunday night at the princess theater and the very first one we ever did we had over a thousand people come we raised over eight thousand pounds and we that that was match funded by shekinah who paid for a mental health worker at the Leonard Stock Centre. We did do another one and uh, in 2018 and as a result of that we started a community choir because uh, we put a, a temporary choir together. 
um, and that's been going ever since and we get 40 people every week along to the community choir with the same sort of cohort of people people who are very much on the fringes it's everything we do is free at the point of access because we believe that the arts has a really holistic uh, way of um, helping people's well-being and and yet, you know, if you want your kids to go to Razzmatazz or Stagecoach, you're looking at about 370 quid a month. I'm the one of the music teachers at the Boys' Grammar and Spires. I'm a piano and singing teacher. And, you know, 30 quid for an hour's um, tuition. You know, most people who are on benefits or homeless or living, you know, hand-to-mouth can't afford that. So Unleashed is about making the arts acce accessible to people who really couldn't afford it. Um, we, we, we were in receipt of uh, funding from the National Lottery, so we've had three years and that's just been renewed, which is fantastic. It's been able to uh, enabled us to really develop what we do. So Unleashed, uh, Under One Roof, one, two, three, uh, as you can see, really successful. And that was where we put a spotlight on um, homelessness in Torbay. Uh, the way that the community drama works, it's very much about giving voice to a lot of the guys who come to our club. So a lot of the issues that they deal with, we put into dramatic context and they can actually uh, they can actually speak onto a third person some of the things they really want to say. When the pandemic happened, um, obviously that was like for everyone. We wondered what we were going to do, but we managed to keep hold of every single person. We we did a an we went online, and it actually it became our most productive time. We bought a load of iPads for a lot of the guys who didn't have computers or um, smartphones. We put SIM cards in it so every week they could access a two-hour workshop. We budded them up with um, leaders who checked up on them every week. We sent them a well-being pack. And we had been commissioned by St. Mary Mags to do a um, heritage project um, about how St. Mary Mags came to being, which is a really interesting story because it was the very first church that had what were called unappropriated pews. Uh, there was a massive scandal in the uh, 1840s where all the rich people were moving into Torbay and uh, they were you know funding the church and stuff like that and they were buying their own pews and the poor were getting squeezed out so St Mag's which I think is quite interesting that it is probably the the, the, the church still right at the forefront of reaching out to the homeless it was set up by a bloke Charles Dawson who left 2,000 quid to um, to establish it as a, 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 a church which had no no appropriated pews so that Paul could go to it. Anyway, we couldn't do that because it was meant to be like a sort of um, a play, the, the little commission that we were. It was meant to be, we were part of the community engagement because they got Heritage Lottery Fund to actually do the spire up. So they commissioned Unleashed Theatre Company to do the, the community engagement. Because we couldn't do a play, we ended up deciding to make it into a film. And um, we made this hour-long costume drama called The Rich and the Pure. You've all got a copy of it in your packs, um, which was the most ambitious project we've ever done. As a joke, my colleague here, <laughs> with a sense of humour, put it in for a load of festivals. And weirdly or enough, we were nominated as Best Film at the London Shorts Film Festival. And then it went on and won Best Original Screenplay at the Cannes Film Festival. It, and it, it's all made and devised by people in recovery, people who are homeless, people who have been um, living on the streets at Torbay. And it's the story of, you know, it, it, we, we wove in together, you know, William Kitson and the bread riots, um, you know, a lot of the uh, cholera epidemic, a lot of stuff that was happening. Bishop Philpotts was the villain of the piece with his big fat, you know, palace, theater, uh, palace um, uh, Bishop Stowe that he built. He was a rotter. And uh, the guy, he was the villain of the piece, and um, will, the guy who was the vicar was the, the hero. It's a great film, and it's all based on facts, so do watch it, and it won the original screenplay. On the back of that, we had a lot of t TV um, uh, coverage. We were on the paper a lot, and we, at that time, were looking to move our base. We were spending about a £1,000 on our um, storage. And um, so we were looking at taking over shop front because we'd heard that, you know, they were big going, we could move into one of those free because it would save people on the business tax. We looked at the law courts. Anyway, then Merlin, who were moving out, they approached us because um, they were, they bought obviously British home stores to make that into the uh, multiplex. And they offered it to us as a private sale. And we had someone come out of the woodwork who uh, very generously uh, funded us half a million pounds and we were able to buy the cinema outright so that we could extend our work and we could also save um, what is in fact the oldest theatre in Torbay. 
Now, although we are working rehabilitation and the, the theatre company that we, that we run is about helping people get back on their feet, we also have a real interest in uh, local heritage. I actually wrote the um, um, official guide to da Agatha Christie in Devon uh, with Matthew Pritchard. He gave me access to all his um, staff. I also wrote the official guide to, um, to Daphne de Maurier in Cornwall. Um, I've written two books. Um, my colleague here has an MA in history, and we're really passionate about history. So actually to take over this amazing building, which has an incredible provenance, it was actually, it actually appears in Charles Dickens' um, diary. He described it as uh, performing in a cow shed when he was on tour, reading from his um, Pickwick papers. Um, the, um, Oscar Wilde, when he was here just before the scandal broke out, when he was staying at Babacom, he performed um, a woman of no importance and uh, in the, in the theatre. The Richard Dawley Cart of the Gilbert Sullivan, who obviously bought Collett, you know Collett Fish Acre is his, his home. Um, they appeared regularly at um, the Royal Lyceum, and Agatha Christie, I know because I wrote a book about her. She went there uh, every week of her life. Her two, uh, her brother and sister took her there and saw, you know, uh, Shakespeare, um, Ibsen, variety, what have you. So it has an incredible provenance, and we feel very, if you like, um, very pleased to have taken over. We have fantastic plans, and the plan is to make it into a, um, a community arts centre for the people. We're very pleased that it's actually in Melville, which is in the most deprived um, sector of Torquay, because it's right on the patch with, you know, Warren Road and houses of multiple occupancy, a lot of social, um, antisocial behaviour, a lot of drug dealers live in there. Uh, these sort of people we want to reach out to. We have a lot of people who are in recovery, who, you know, have all been drug addicts, who have, you know, come out of prison. Um, and, um, and also, we have a real, um, we have a heart for uh, adults with additional needs. My wife is, um, she's in senior management at Mayfield, has worked there years. Um, and we have a lot of adults in uh, all the groups, um, the choir, the drama group, uh, the children's choir, who have additional needs. My wife and I set up a charity um, uh, in uh, in Karangueri, we um, we are building a school in uh, Nairobi, and in fact, next week, my wife and I will be out there working in the school. We've been supporting them for the last five years, and basically, it was this woman who saves. Um, children with special needs off the streets because otherwise they'd be locked up in a little shack while their parents go out and and, um, and beg. And this, uh, you can see on there, we I've put that in there. It's got nothing to do with um, Unleashed Theatre Company, but just to let you know that we, you know, my background and our heart is we run this other charity where we're paying for eight teachers a, a, a month, every month. We send out money for food. Um, we sponsor the kids. We put that water tank in. We've rebuilt the school and we're looking to... The, and yet it's on it's built on a sewer and they've got to get out and we're we're going out there to see how we can purchase a hundred thousand pound school anyway moving on the point i'm re making that is because we do have plans to make it into an art center and we are really keen to develop um work with our adults we work with um the recovery community the ex community the uh, ex homeless community but also adults with um additional needs and um i think joe's given me um permission to say that i know that torbay council are very very keen to possibly uh, come in and take uh, and take over the bottom floor it's a massive building we would love you to come you can come and see the rich and the pure which is being put on if you look at the previous uh, previous um screen sorry previous screen We've already had, we've only been open since May. We had the Making Melville Marvellous AGM there. We had our Platinum Jubilee concert there. We've had a tour from Salt Mine Theatre Company, Rich, Rich and the Pure screening. We, oh, this Thursday, we've got Operation Emotion, who works with, work with adults who have been sexually abused. And they're showing a film um, specifically for people who have been sexually abused as children, how they can come to terms and get help for that. And it's, it's run by the NHS. Doctors are running that. And, um, d you know, it's a free film you can come and see and there's a question and answer afterwards uh, we have an inter-school uh, Dragon's Den which is happening in November uh, South Devon Players uh, they're doing Beowulf in December we've got a Mencap Big Band um, concert and we've got our own Unleashed Christmas Choir now why am I telling you this is because this is already up and running we've only been there since May 
um, we we are only using a third of the building, and yet the bottom half, of the bottom third of the building, is right on street level, and will be absolutely brilliant for um, the purposes, I think, of what out of social care are looking looking at. I know it's a bit cheeky for me to say that, but we, I would love to say, are really keen to to um, to go into partnership and see that building used. Um, the middle section we're focusing on. We've just received um, ten thousand pounds for our resilience um, research, so that we. We can get all our ducks in a row to go for major funding from the Arts Council, from um, obviously government, uh, from Comic Relief, people like that, who, uh, and also from the, the Heritage Lottery Fund, to actually make it into a state-of-the-art art centre for the common people. I said this on Sunday night. And when I say common people, I mean basically people who would not normally engage with the arts and who would not normally be able to afford to engage with the arts. Um, I know this is very, very cheeky, and I'm going to say it anyway because hey I'm here but um, we came to the party very late when it came to the, um, the town regeneration fund and yet we are sat on the oldest theatre in Torbay which has a fantastic heritage we're already up and running we've got a massive program of events we want to work with the council we would love to see whether there was any way that we could have a chunk of some of that money from the uh, town's uh, regeneration fund because we're actually doing it already you know, and if it doesn't happen, we will still do it anyway. But we want you to know that actually, if there was any money from that fund, we would greatly welcome it. Um, I, I hope that makes sense. What we've put in your pack is our, um, our official um, film that we won, the Cannes Film Festival with the, for original screenplay with the recovery groups, all about Torbay. Uh, you've got the program which talks about the, the work that we do. Uh, we're, we've actually started working with the Memory Cafe and Paint, and we're, we're, we're launching a dementia choir. We've already done the first session with that. You know, we're up and running doing stuff that um, is going to really benefit the Melville community. And we see it, our vision. I make no bones about the fact I'm a Christian, but you know, I'm not, I'm not here to bash anyone over the head and all the stuff we do, nobody jumps through any hoops for Martin Harris. But my heart is to actually serve the community and for that um, place to be a vision of a beacon of light and hope for um, the disenfranchised uh, communities of Torbay. Thank you very much. Does anyone have any questions? Thank, thank, thank you, Martin. And, um your enthusiasm is infectious, there's no doubt about that, and um, I think the work that's going on um, in Abbey Road, it is ideally located as well um, for many of the projects that you're talking about. I think I can answer your question about the Regeneration Fund, because the town deal funding was for specific projects and specific areas. That said, you know, through that partnership work and collaboration uh, with the council and yourselves and other groups, um, you know, the door's always open for conversations and to be able to help support funding bids, etc. cetera. Um, not necessarily with match funding because, the, you know, our, our cupboard is bare. I'm looking at our finance director. Um, but, you know, there, there's always opportunities. Um, but has anyone got any quick questions um, for Martin? Councillor Law. Not really a question, but just to say, fantastic, amazing what you've achieved in that short time. I'm so proud. I'm, I'm a councillor for the area. I've met several of, of the people who are involved in the, the project, and it just makes my heart sing every single time. So just thank you. It makes me quite emotional, actually. But it, it's just fantastic. And I, should, we, I think we, I can say for us all, we really share your vision for that space. Thank you. Councillor Moore. Yeah, without <coughs> sounding condescending, I thank you for the work that you're doing. It is much appreciated, and I guess it needs to be shouted out loud. So sometimes Torbay is not credited for the work it's doing. Yours is a prime example of, of a good news story, if you like. I don't know if you've contacted, been in contact with Martin Thomas, who is our lead um, lead officer on. Our, um, culture and yes, we, we, we have uh, linked up with him um, and we're hoping to sort of develop that relationship, yes, definitely, particularly with um, potential Arts Council funding. Yeah, that's what I, I was hoping. Thanks. Anyone else? <coughs> uh, Councillor Foster. <coughs> 
microphone. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Men, I'd just like to um, add as to what Martin has been saying. Uh, have attended a number of the events that they've put on. Uh, the Rich and the Pure was absolutely excellent acting by people who are either in recovery, been homeless. When you hear the, st you know, you see them acting, and then you hear the stories afterwards, you you just cannot believe that you know it's the it, it's the same person. So there's a, loads of um, work going on. So I'd highly recommend it because not only, I mean, it is about Torquay. It's a little bit history that I didn't know about. So it is educational as well. The story that that they are telling. And uh, I was at the show on Sunday night, the Unleashed at the Princess Theatre, and again, that was absolutely amazing. And what, what struck me mostly was the warmth of the people in the audience, you know, what they see. So you've seen a show, um, you know, with people who, who have, uh, you know, who have a history. Some of them did talk about their history. But it was the warmth from the people in the audience, you know, towards it. It was really, really amazing. So, and so there's so many people in Turkey or already who appreciate you know the work that that martin does done and, and and i think as a council we should support it wherever we can thank you thank you councillor foster councillor by thank you mr chairman i've known martin since we appeared in the princess theater production of kiss me kate <laughs> and, and you were the star uh, and I wasn't, and, uh, and, and I was never asked again, but there we go. Um, I, I, I've watched what you've done and support it, and I was there. I didn't appreciate that Hazel was there on Sunday night. I was there on Sunday night, and you, you went on, as you said, nearly as long as the Ken Dodd show. We, 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 we certainly all got our money's worth. This is, to me, the best news in Torquay Town Centre. You know, you're bringing to life what was a theatre, where my mum used to say she went to see the pantomime on Boxing Day with my grandfather in, in the 1920s, without sort of giving away mum's age. But she's not here, nor to um, be upset about that. But, you know, in the 20s and 30s, it was a theatre. It was the theatre. It was believed to be or is believed to be the first theatre that Frank Matcham the yeah. distinguished theatre architect who was born in Newton Abbott who lived in Torquay actually worked on well, there's no proof of that. I mean he's an incredible historic so that amazing generous donation and you making um, use of it so I'm, I'm, I'm not here to ask Martin a question I'm here to ask you a question I do not understand why you can't look at the town deal and the funding for the town deal when you know, and it'll come on in a moment in private business, and we were here till 10 o'clock last week. We are struggling, it seems, to deliver the town deal project. We are struggling to deliver £20 million that the government has earmarked for Torquay. I do not understand why this particular project cannot now be considered, because there is delivery, there's the proof of delivery, and it takes every single box that the town deal project is supposed to be all about. So the question, please, to you, Mr Chairman, and colleagues on the town deal board, is please, please, please give consideration to the Unleashed Theatre Company and the just amazing work that they are doing there in Abbey Road. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Byen. I think, um, and uh, Alan Denby will crit correct me if I'm wrong, but the town investment plan was the criteria by which the, uh, the Torquay town bid, town deal, was um, uh, approved by, and it was quite prescriptive. Um, I, I believe that there are ways in which you can via between projects that are listed in, in that investment plan. It's unfortunate that this project wasn't alive at the time that that was being written, because I totally agree with you, Nick, that that would have been an ideal opportunity to be included, a bit like we have done with the Paint and Picture House and the Future High Streets funding in painting. But as I say, you know, the door's open to discussions about how we can support um, the, the, the development of that really important space, not just for the community and, and its heritage, but also for the, the kind of work that you're, and the cohort that you're seeking to support. So, and I know that you're in contact with the Director of Adult um, Social Care as well, so um, you've already referenced that. So, you know, other departments' doors will be open, you know, if, if you knock on them. Thank you very much, Martin. Really appreciate um, your attendance tonight and uh, an up uplifting presentation. Yeah. And good luck. Thank you. Thank you. 
you're welcome to stay, but equally you're welcome to go and have a cup of tea or something. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, um, we have no urgent items that I'm aware of. Um, so we'll move on to item seven, which is the domestic abuse and sexual violence strategy, um, which is going to be proposed by Councillor Carter. Thank you. Uh, the d domestic abuse and sexual violence strategy requires renewing as it runs out this year. Recently, we did a strategic review of the strategy and the findings have been used to inform this draft strategy we are proposing today. From the review, it was decided to continue to address both the domestic abuse and sexual violence strategies, but with more of a focus on the sexual violence element. Incorporated in this draft strategy are the findings from the Call to Action Sexual Violence Project from last year in which Torbay Council and other services were involved. In addition, information on the data uh, about sexual violent, violence services and demand has informed the local position on sexual violence in Torbay. This draft strategy also seeks to be more responsive, uh, especially to Torbay's diversity. Although women are more likely to experience domestic abuse and sexual violence than men, it is recognised that men are victims too. As are residents from ethnic minority backgrounds and from the LGBTQ plus community. Also, pregnancy increases the risk from suffering domestic abuse. You have the draft strategy along with the background documents in the pack and I therefore propose the recommendation on page 16, 3.1 that the draft domestic abuse and sexual violence strategy as set out in Appendix 1 to the submitted report be approved for a six-week public consultation. So moved. Thank you, Councillor Carter. Uh, Councillor Stockman to second. So thank you, Chair. Um, as this is a document that's gone out to consultation, I don't propose... Um, to go through the whole thing but suffice to say when I was reading it um, I was really moved by um, what I was reading um, and to such an extent I don't like using paper but you can see that every time I saw something that was of interest I printed it off and so contained within this report are all the figures and the estimate, estimate, estimations from um, an independent consultancy firm, Davis and Associates, which you'll see in the summary pack. And what I would say is, for, to everybody, a plea, read it. Read the report, understand the importance, and come back with your feedback on this report. There's a raft of um, proposals contained within this. Um, and what it actually points to is even closer working relationships because, um, well, it, some of it, uh, Cordelia often gets moved. I was really moved with some of the stories that were being read um, or being told. Um, and yeah, yeah, it. It really did move me, so I'm going to save what I was going to say um, because I've sort of been on a journey with this from when I first became a councillor in 2011 um, and saw it through stages of overview and scrutiny and what has happened to our budgets, etc., over the years. So I'm going to save that for when it comes back to council um, to share my thoughts on it. But suffice to say... Um, with no disrespect to our police officers whatsoever because of the immense pressure, part of the issues that they have had and being put in special measures relates to some of the things that you will see within the reports. Um, and that just says to me that things have got to change um, because women and some of the men, the, I mean, it's, I think it, I did write down the figures, it was... Um, 
30, 63% were women and 32% were males that have actually suffered um, abuse. And there's an estimate of 125 pregnant women experience domestic violence. And that horrifies me. Um, I don't know whether Tara is going to speak to this subject, but uh, like I said, the main thing for this is for everybody to read it and to come back and have their say, and please don't let there just be half a dozen people <coughs> respond. So I know this is being streamed live, and I would think this is one of the single most important things that we need to address in Torbay. It has so many implications for children's services, you know, there's family breakdowns, housing crisis, all of those things are all rolled up into this one report. So that, that's all I can say with regards to seconding this. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Tara, did you want to add anything? I don't think I can follow that. I think you're exactly right, Councillor Stockman. Um, the main thread that we wanted to pull through this document was people's stories and actually informed by people's voices. And it's lovely to hear that that's come through loud and clear. Um, like yourself, I would encourage everybody to read the document. It, we have got an abridged version, believe it or not, um, attached. Um, so there's a lot more data and information and stories that sit behind it. Um, but you're exactly right. It's very important. And, and thank you for your kind words. Thank you. Councillor Law. Yeah, thank you. I'm, I know we're here today to okay this strategy to go out to consultation. And I'd like to make an appeal for all councillors, everybody who's here, to share this consultation widely. Because as we can see from the equalities matrix that we use against all our decisions that's attached to our paperwork, you know, domestic abuse and sexual violence strategy will affect just about every single section of our communities. So people of all ages, genders, ethnic backgrounds, socioeconomic status, members of the LGBT community, people with disabilities, everyone, everyone and anyone can be affected by domestic abuse and sexual violence. So this strategy is a strategy that absolutely everybody should be feed, would I would ask everybody to feed back on. Don't think it's not you, it can't happen to you, it doesn't happen to people you know. Mm -hmm. You don't know it happens to people you know until it's happened. Mm -hmm. So um, I think it's really important, and I'd particularly like to um, think it's particularly important that we hear, hear from the people for whom services in the past haven't actually been very visible and responsive, such as our LGBTQ communities. and. I just want to add a little thing aside here because while I support the strategy with all my heart, there's a line in the accompanying report which absolutely confirmed one of my worst fears in terms of the far-reaching socio-economic impacts of the slow motion wrecking ball that's been the fiscal incompetence demonstrated by the Conservative Prime Minister and her colleagues over the last three weeks. That line under the cumulative community impacts reads quite simply, Continued and worsening economic hardship for citizens will most likely result in increased incidence of domestic abuse. If we see that rise, I'll lay that firmly at the feet of this government. But it makes it even more important that we all share this strategy and get people to feed into it to make sure that this strategy is fit for the needs of our community who will need it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Law. Councillor Foster. Well, I'll just, just the microphone. I'll first just add that uh, I'm disappointed that Councillor Law decided to uh, bring politics into it, because I think this uh, issue of domestic violence can affect anybody and anybody anywhere. Uh, it's not always about money. So um, I was at the party conference a few weeks ago in Birmingham, one of the fringe meetings. Who was given a talk about it? Mel B from the Spice Girls. Money, fame, you think somebody would be really happy and would have everything what they wanted. She was in 10 years in an abusive relationship. So we heard the stories and about why she never left. Because we, you know, so many people on the outside, they think, well, why doesn't the person leave? And it's not easy. And for somebody with money, with fame, 
still couldn't do it. And I think that's just an, it was an example to everybody there how it can really, really affect everybody. So, Councillor Law, it's not just about money. So, coming on to the report, I would just like to say, I think, you know, the report going out to consultation, that's brilliant. So, I hope it can go as wide as it possibly can. And I think the Appendix 1 was really, really good. I give you compliments because it was talking about all the different reasons why it was given examples. And for anybody reading that, it would give them a better understanding of what the issues are. So, um, you know, I'm from Coventry and we had the Daniel Pelker case of a little boy that died domestic violence was rife organizations knew about the domestic violence it wasn't picked up how it could affect the children and what could be happening with a child so i think that's just a you know one example it it, it, it can affect everybody it affects families as well and there was some statistics and i can't remember what they were but uh, i did hear somebody say if you're in a room of so many people it's highly likely that there'll be a victim in there and for every victim, there's also a perpetrator. So it's, it's in amongst us. We don't know where it is. And people, to read this report, make them more aware of what is going on. And because uh, it's also about being at work and seeing it in your own office, seeing it when you go you know, to certain events and family and friends about recognising it when you see it and helping them people to either report it or help them through the system. So it's about education for us all as to what the problems are and for us as a council to try and make sure through partnerships there's the standing tall which is for, for the domestic abuse and sexual violence. They're doing a lot of good work with a lot of partnerships and I think I came here last year, we had something come to the council and I, I'd been somewhere and they'd given a presentation how there's a charity which supports pets. So if you're in a, um, a relationship and you have to leave, what do you do with your dog? What do you do with your cat? What do you do with the children's hamster? So there's lots of charities out there who are all involved. So I hope this consultation can reach all of them as well. And uh, you know, so that when the result does come back, we can get a bigger picture uh, uh, as to how the council can help. So thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Foster. And I think um, it's, it's a matter that's close to my heart because of a close family member who's experienced that kind of coercive, <coughs> excuse me, uh, coercive and controlling behaviour and uh, felt trapped. Um, and it took a very brave decision ultimately to, to break out. Um, so it, it's something that is very close to my heart. And like everyone else, I absolutely hope we can reach as many people to get the feedback. Um, because there's also the other side, you know, why are perpetrators perpetrators? Um, and I think, you know, I'm not putting words into Councillor Law's mouth, but I think part of the, the challenge, particularly when you've got um, downturn in economics, or, and you're absolutely right, Councillor Foster, is, you know, there's lots of examples of really wealthy people, successful people living in, in um, abusive relationships um, and not being able to break free. Um, but equally, the pressures of not being able to pay the bills at the end of the weekend of the month adds to the pressures within and, and leads to breakdowns. And I think we need to be really alive to those, particularly as we enter into the, the coming uh, uh, winter months and, and beyond. Um, but I think, you know, as a council, we have our responsibility, and it's about identifying behavioural changes in people. You know, people who may have been outgoing, people who may have been going out regularly with their friends, meeting up, not being able to text each other anymore. Those kind of things, those little signals that you can pick up in, in terms of and making sure that companies and organisations in the public sector, in the charitable sector, etc., have the mechanism to be able to identify those um, issues and then um, report them through and encourage people to say, you're not alone. And I think that's the strongest message. Um, I know Councillor Law wants to come back. And then I'll bring in Councillor Bai. Yeah, I, I just want to say that I did make the point that anyone and everyone can suffer from domestic violence. There is a known causal link between deprivation, poverty, and the stresses that lead can lead to these things. That's the point I'm making because we are facing some of the bleakest times. Ordinary people's mortgages have gone up to way beyond what they can afford. And I worry. I'm entitled to worry. That's my compassion. 
I'm terrified for what people are facing this winter. And I really, you know, having seen, having experienced people on my doorstep fleeing domestic violence, having put roofs over people's heads, I know better than anyone, as much as anyone else, shall I say here, the impacts of domestic violence on a family, on friendship circles, and actually on a whole community. I was no intention, Councillor Foster, to belittle the severity and the importance of it. It was purely and simply that I am scared for people this winter, genuinely scared for our families and our children, our elderly, everybody. There's no one I'm not scared about. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Bowie. Thank you again, Mr Chairman. And I think it is something that we should all work together cross-party. I think that there is a shared uh, interest in, in resolving these issues. And I think in all, all groups and none, as it were, I think we all, all feel that this perhaps is the most hidden of our social issues for in, in the Bay. And I think it, it is, it's one of the big things in the Bay, and absolutely right. I just wanted to say I believe this report and the draft strategy, and it, this, there are two strategies. I looked at them fairly quickly this afternoon. There's, there's two bits, and I'm not quite sure how they link together, but it's in two bits. But it is extremely well written, and I think this is something that we should absolutely all support. As overview and scrutiny lead for children's services, I want to highlight the links that there are. You know, d domestic abuse, domestic violence, is absolutely linked with, with poor housing. So there's references here to the need for accommodation. I think those are things that we are, haven't been very good at delivery, and I think that is things that we need we need to focus on. It's sort of meaningful to try and move things forward. But the, the figures that I thought were particularly stunning, I think people should appreciate, domestic abuse accounts for 22% of all crimes in Torbay. I wonder how much people in the community appreciate that. So more than a fifth, nearly a quarter of all crimes in Torbay are, are domestic abuse. That, that to me I thought was stunning. And then for children's services, it is projected that 30%, 667 of referrals to children's services in 2020-2021 had domestic abuse as a factor and 40% of these referrals came from the police, and 164 children became looked after where domestic, it says were, but where domestic abuse was a factor over the three years 2018 to 2021. So these links between domestic abuse, poor housing, all that stuff that we've really got to tackle and perhaps we haven't moved quickly enough in recent times to tackle, and then the pressure that has on children's services. So it's an exceptional problem in Torbay, and I think is a clue as to why we've had exceptional and still have exceptional numbers of children and young people in our care. Having sort of said all that, and it is a first-class piece of work, and this is for consultation, I would hope that it could be kind of condensed more. It could be explained how things are going to be done differently in the future to make things better and that explained in a simpler way so although it's extremely well written there's lots of voices a, a kind of a, a little pricey somewhere someone who is in in the situation of enduring experiencing domestic abuse could be reassured in very simple ways what we're going to do to, to help alleviate these issues but I think it's really really good work and I would hope that we all all support this without without any politics thank you so much thank you councillor by any other colleagues no in that case I'll move to the vote all those in favor unanimous chair thank you uh, we'll move on to item 8 the housing strategy consultation um, councillor Long <coughs> Thank you very much, uh, Mr Chairman. Um, the current uh, housing strategy was adopted prior to the pandemic in 2020. Uh, the world has changed considerably since then. Um, then, uh, since then, and the Housing Delivery Group and the Strategic Housing Board have recommended that the 
uh, housing strategy be reviewed given all the changes that have happened uh, not only in, in Torbay but uh, UK and worldwide. Torbay was facing a, a housing crisis before the pandemic and that crisis is now on, on steroids. Um, in the last two years there has been a huge increase in demand for both rented uh, and housing ownership pushing up prices uh, and rents. Uh, a number of challenges uh, face us uh, in the housing market. Um, in Torbay we only have 8% social rented stock and that compares to 18% nationally. Local housing allowance rates are below benefit rents, benefit rates, so private rents are unaffordable for many people uh, on, on benefits. There's also been a, a huge increase in holiday accommodation demand, and I'm sure that I can't be the only councillor who's had casework from uh, dealing with people whose accommodation has been turned into holiday accommodation <coughs> and being evicted. Um, Homes available on the housing register have also declined 6% in, in, in recent years. Uh, and also demand outstrips supply for new affordable homes by a considerable amount. Um, and there isn't going to be enough um, brownfield land to uh, provide the empty homes that are the needed. And the current economic crisis is only going to make things worse for, for many, many people. Pages 110 and 111 of the report outline how the Council is trying to improve supply uh, and will continue to do so in the future. Just to cover some of the things that we have done and are planning to do in, in the strategy, uh, we have created um, Tor Vista, who will develop a number of specialist <coughs> homes for older uh, and disabled people. Um, we plan to take advantage of uh, Home England's Affordable ho Homes Programme. Um, and we established a, a strategic housing partnership to help drive our, our agenda forward. We're using uh, regeneration for housing and uh, we're also buying, plan to buy homes for, for temporary accommodation as, as well. Uh, we've uh, we've um, uh, appointed an empty homes officer to help uh, you know, fill those homes that are empty at, at the moment. And we're also, uh, as links to what Councillor Byer was saying just now, um, the strategy includes uh, policies for care experienced children who, who uh, are leaving the, the temporary accommodation that they're in into permanent homes. The vision for the draft strategy is to improve the delivery, affordability and quality of housing um, and we also want to improve our, our customer service as well. Whilst the foundations for more affordable homes have been laid, uh, we do need to do much more. Um, this strategy is going out to consultation um, and so I and obviously will come back to us once we've heard from that consultation, which we're planning to do far and wide. But I'd like to, to move that, please, Mr Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Long. Uh, Councillor Moray, I believe you're wishing to second. Yes, Chair, happy to second. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, a balanced housing market is essential to sustainable communities. But this will not be achieved without the right level of new housing uh, development, which includes a mixture of purchased and rented. And as, with, as because of social rented housing being devastated over the last 30 years, it is essential that we concentrate on this area in particular. I can remember, <coughs> I can remember the uh, days of the reign of Margaret Thatcher who made it nigh on impossible for local authorities to provide uh, rent, rented accommodation. Uh, and we have been suffering that price ever since. So as well as providing desperately needed homes, house building also delivers sustain, uh, substantial benefits and better facilities to, for the wider community. The affordability and the environmental sustainability of homes will be crucial factors in getting that balance right between homes, jobs, the green environment and protection of the, protecting the climate. We already know from our community-led neighbourhood plans that protecting the natural environment in Torbay is a priority, along with more affordable homes, reducing the impact of climate change <clears throat> and creating a sustainable economy. 
There is, no doubt, a little appetite for greenfield development. So while the, while the creation of much needed homes is essential, we must be mindful to limit the reduction of the green spaces. Housing is unaffordable to many in Torbay Chair. Um, the average house price is nine times greater than the annual earnings of, of an individual. And house prices have, as we know, increased substantially since 2020. Therefore, we must concentrate on providing what our young people need and what they can afford. Chair, I just want to end up with one obvious comment in my, uh, in my opinion. A decent home for every person in Torbay is not a luxury. It's a God-given right um, in any caring society. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Morey. Uh, any other Cabinet colleagues? I will come in myself, but first I'll bring in um, Councillor Tom Thomas, and then I see Councillor Lewis in the virtual room. Thank you, Councillor Cowell. Um, I've got a number of questions, and uh, they are split out into three sections. So maybe if I um, just run through the questions, and, and um, maybe one of the Cabinet members could pick up on the answers for me. Um, so the first one revolves around page 105, uh, where it talks about our housing ambition. Uh, could you just quantify for us, please, what uh, the administration's housing ambition currently is? The paragraph before that talks about uh, 615 homes from the local plan down to 495, and we know consultation is out at the moment for something south of that. And we've heard uh, Councillor Morris' passionate speech this evening about it being a God-given right. Um, so if we could just have quantification on that housing ambition, that would be helpful. Um, the second area I would like some clarity on is page 106. And these uh, are the areas that, these are your strengths. These are the things that uh, you're, you're pushing forward at the moment. Uh, question uh, on uh, Preston Down Road. Uh, the, the line is delivering 100 plus new homes. Well, I've seen the uh, planning application in for that on Preston Down Road. Maximising affordable homes is actually in there as a bracket. Could you just explain what that means? Um, and two times extra care homes of 150 units. Um, are, these on, are these still on course? And when can we see occupation? of that. And the final thing I want to move on to, um, and I'm happy to recap on any of these because I understand there is a lot of stuff. The final thing is basically, um, you spoke about the things that you've already done. So if we can just have a little bit of clarity on those things that you've already done, three in particular. Created Tor Vista, um, how many units have been created by Tor Vista uh, up to now? Home England, you, you spoke about the involvement of Home England and what they have put into the bay. How many units of Home England actually created in the last four years? And finally, the empty home officer uh, being employed. How many units has the empty homes officer uh, brought back into, into play in the last, uh, well, in their current employ? So a number of questions, but I think that would hopefully give us a bit of a, a move forward with this document. Thank you. Councillor Long. Thank you very much, and thank you for the questions, Councillor Thomas. Um, um, just on the um, uh, housing ambition, I think the, uh, there, there is absolutely a fine balance that has to be struck between the number of affordable homes we produce, and homes of all types, plus also protecting uh, our green fields, and that's the uh, uh, ambition that we have to satisfy both those things. Um, on Preston Down Road um, and maximising the affordable homes, I think we spoke in overview and scrutiny last week about uh, this, um, this administration's ambition to um, create as many affordable homes on that site um, as is possible, and we're in talk, we've been uh, soft market testing with a number of uh, providers. Uh, 
our registered providers about increasing the number above the 30% um, um, policy compliance. Uh, and uh, speaking for myself, I'm delighted that uh, there are providers who are saying that they can increase more. I'm sure the ward councillors are equally delighted that there will be more affordable homes uh, on that site as well, above the 30%. The um, uh, Tor Vista, they've got a number of um, next steps properties. I believe that was 13 off the top of my head. The, and then there's um, also going to be the nine at Tweenaway Cross. And then there are going to be the um, the properties that are going to be purchased as well for temporary accommodation. Well, I'm not quite sure whether they'll be uh, managing those or not. So, and they're also going to be involved with the St Kilda's and the uh, Crossways. Um, and uh, and Tor Marine as well. Tor Marine, I believe, is in for planning and will be coming to a um, uh, a planning committee as soon as uh, uh, that is possible, along with St Kilda's as well. Um, and um, Crossways, we're just uh, sorting out the final finances for the demolition of that building. But in terms of occupation, I'm not sure whether officers can uh, uh, advise on likely dates for that. Uh, or not. Um, and the Homes England question, I'm going to have to go to offices as well on that one. Thank you. David? Um, the extra care facilities, the intention is April 2024 uh, for those facilities. Uh, the Homes England uh, relationship is, is a building one that both myself and Tara and other sections of the organisation uh, work very closely with. Uh, I couldn't put a figure on the number of dwellings that we could directly um, relate to what Homes England have produced, but we are having major discussions over bringing some of those really big sites into play with their infrastructure funding that may, may support that. But I, I couldn't say to you, um, thus far, it's been X number of dwellings that Homes England's input has, um, has made a difference over. But they have, they have sorry, through you, they have delivered in these four years, delivered buildings that are actually up now, Homes England. They, they themselves don't deliver, no. They provide the funding to assist the registered providers to provide affordable homes, and they can now start to provide some infrastructure funding as well. So. I think uh, what is important to recognise is that during the course of the last two or three years, and Councillor Long referred to the world we now live in, a post-COVID world, and there has been a significant shift in some elements of the housing market. But where there has also been a significant shift is Torbay Council's relationship with Homes England. It, it, there was no relationship um, back in 2019. Um, Homes England never saw Torbay as being serious about delivering um, affordable homes. Um, the relationship with registered providers, uh, housing associations, um, it was equally as poor. Um, through the hard work of um, the administration and particularly officers, uh, working with Homes England, talking to them about some of those more challenged sites. Um, the challenge is increased because of the increased costs of delivery and building, uh, building materials as we know have gone through the roof, um, and also the uh, uh, collapse of um, Midas impacted the delivery of Tweenaway. Um, so the, the, the pace of delivery has not been the, the rate we would have liked, but what this is, this is a discussion tonight about putting out a document for consultation for people to feedback. It's not an overview and scrutiny session. Those questions may be best served on one of those occasions. Um, but we are absolutely committed, and through some of the uh, organisational changes within the Council, to prioritise, such as the appointment of the uh, Assistant Director for Housing, um, Tracy John, um, to actually fo provide that corporate focus, bringing together the many threads that were spread to all four corners of the Council by the previous administration. Um, we haven't had a housing department in Torbay probably for 20 plus years. Um, we have that appalling uh, level of only 8% social rent in Torbay. If you're talking about ambition, my ambition would be to get that figure up to the national average. That is where my ambition would be. So, and a lot of that will be also informed by the uh, 
current consultation in terms of the local plan refresh. So uh, um, I have Councillor Lewis next, please, in the virtual room. Uh, thank you very much indeed, um, Mr. Chairman. I'm sorry I can't be with you tonight. <clears throat> um, very interesting about Preston Land Road, which of course was in part two last week, but we have now been told that uh, as many uh, affordable homes as possible will be um, delegated on that site, which uh, wasn't in the public domain until tonight. Um, crossways, we were also told the other night that there was no end user. So it was going to be demolished with no end user. But my real question is, um, <clears throat> we've had the strategy. Can Council Long tell us when the action plan, because that's the major thing, when we're actually going to get something done in the Bay? The strategy, I would say, is a bit bland. It will go out for con um, consultation. But the real question is, when will we see the action plan so that we get something moving in the Bay? Thank you. Councillor Long. Thanks very much. And I think if we'd uh, got the action plan ready before the document had gone to consultation, we'd be accused of not taking consultation seriously. So um, the action plan will be ready once the consultation has been agreed. Um, and um, I will take Councillor Lewis's comment about Preston Down Road as being uh, uh, a very warm welcome for extra affordable homes uh, in uh, Preston Down Road um, um, for that. Uh, and Crossways not having an end user, there are definite plans for Crossways and what it will be, be, become. Um, but I think waiting for everything to be absolutely perfect and um, tenants all lined up for, for things uh, just um, will result in that site being um, as it is now. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Bai. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was going to make that same suggestion that perhaps I join you at this cabinet, or, or maybe not, and maybe wait till next May. This but isn't we go. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't Downing Street. I genuinely, with this item, come to the table in despair. I question the need for a further housing strategy, further consultation, further energy expended, when what people want is more housing. The actual strategy that this administration, and it was this administration, adopted in your early years, with quite clear targets outlining the need, seemed to me a much more solid piece of work than what has been put forward. The failure, and I do echo what Councillor Lewis has to say on this, the failure is delivery. It is shameful, to, to use one of the favourite words of someone who isn't here tonight, it is shameful, the very poor delivery. And I think that should be made clearer in this document. So one of the things that I feel, even before it goes out to consultation, you're talking about an average of 343 uh, dwellings delivered since 2016. I think you should actually list the numbers that have been delivered. Say, you've, you've talked about going back 20 years. I was mayor from 2005 to 2011, and I smashed the target that was set by the Liberal Democrats on the council, and we delivered in excess of 100 social rental or social housing units each year. That was a target that was set, that was a target that was smashed, and at the same time there were years when we achieved over 600, I think one year nearly 700. I think it would be incredibly useful as you would go out to consultation to the community to actually list the numbers that have been delivered so they can see what has been achieved. I mean, the nonsense that's written here. I mean, a paragraph at random. There is a little appetite for greenfield development despite the level of additional homes required. But you tell that to the homeless. You tell that to the people waiting on the list. You tell that to the 150 families who are in bed and breakfast at the moment. And then, oh, wait for it. So we need to be bold, innovative, creative and sensitive in the delivery of those additional homes. I'm sorry, it just doesn't stand up. That is just a load of. It really is. It is a load of. The previous strategy, I think, was actually quite a decent piece of work. It's the failure to deliver. At the start of this, you, you've got your impact, equality, uh, impact assessment. 
it's list it's just bizarre listing all, all the, the impacts for equality young and it just says neutral 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 if it doesn't actually make things more positive for young people or it doesn't make things more positive for older people it's just a complete waste of time it's so badly written it's so badly drafted once again, as a lead member for Children's Services on Overview and Scrutiny, not lead member for Children's Services, the lead member does an excellent job. I'm Overview and Scrutiny lead for Children's Services, and you know, we, we see eye to eye on those things. There were five recommendations in the Housing Crisis Review on the needs for accommodation, for care experience and cared for young people. In it, We are not making progress. I sat at a Children's Continuous Improvement Board meeting when yesterday when this was discussed. It was a private meeting. It gave me no hope or confidence whatsoever any progress is being made on that matter. None whatsoever, because people aren't speaking together. And we, we've been inspected by the government. You know, we want to get to outstanding for children's services. We'd be lucky to hold on to the grade of good if we don't do something about accommodation for young people, particularly care experience young people. I feel very, very, very passionate about it. I mean, some of the language is, I mean, dear, dear Councillor Maury, and you, you know I'm a great fan, but to, to, and I think it was you just now talking about laying the foundations. And in, in this, I'm trying to find that, you know, that wretched cliche of laying the foundations is, is here in, in this, in this really frankly, rubbish report. It says laying the foundation. What a cliche, when there are no foundations pretty much being laid in the bay. When in the last couple of years we've gone back to delivering about the same number, well, about half the number of houses each year that were delivered in the whole period, modern period of Tor Bay, since, since the railway began, or the railway came here in the mid-19th century. I reckon if you add up our housing stock, see that there's very little in the mid-19th century. We've been delivering about 400 homes a year since the middle of the 19th century. It's been growing quite naturally and quite reasonably, and we're now down, as you know, to about 200. Totally inadequate. It is the biggest failure of this council, and I don't see this strategy or consultation is going to make any difference without a commitment to delivery. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Stockman. Could Councillor Bice stay there? Because I want to ask him a couple of questions, if you wouldn't mind. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's this. Um, when you say shameful, who, who are you pointing the finger at um, for something being shameful? Because um, from my point of view, the shameful thing is that developers are um, allowed to hold on to developments or sites which they have planning permission for and never build it out and the government does absolutely nothing about it. The shameful thing is um, that none of us, including your own party in the previous years since you've been mayor, you know, have produced more than about 300 or so houses in any given year. That is the shameful thing. The shameful thing is that the budgets to our, you know, our councils have been cut year on year and year. So it doesn't give us much option to actually insensitise building or build them ourselves on our own council land. That's the shameful thing. Um, not, and I know as a estate agent on a Saturday morning, obviously selling houses is important to your family and has been for a, a long, long time, and there's nothing wrong with that. But there is a fine balance. Not everyone in Torbay would agree with you that all greenfield sites should be built on. And I have heard you say lots of times about, oh, it's not a problem, build on there, build on there. People do not want to lose their greenfield sites, not all of them, you know. Um, we have habitats, you know, for bats and ecological things that people value. Green areas, I've seen you walking around a lot, you know, and looking on the green areas and what a benefit it is for mental health, for play, for open play for children. And if you just go run rife over it, this is just a consultation document. The local plan is also out for consultation and there's a minimum figure which is roughly the same as what we produce at the moment and have done for several years. Are you now saying then that the Conservatives don't wish to take any notice of neighbourhood plans? Because if you take your view, that's what you're saying, because the Conservatives with the Liberal Democrats, I believe, 
introduced neighbour planning, as in you, you still have to build, but you can choose where you build, but are you now saying that that's not necessary anymore, so we're all going to just build wherever ever we like? Can, you know? can, I, can I actually um, bring the debate to the matter in hand, which yes. is about sending out a document to consultation? Um, and I think it's important that whilst there is a serious and genuine debate to be had about the, the housing delivery, the challenges around housing delivery, the challenging, challenges around land supply to enable that delivery, who delivers that in terms of the public or private or, or RP sectors, those debates are to inform a strategy. So the, the challenging uh, comments that we've heard from colleagues um, from the opposite side of the chamber, um, I look forward to seeing that contribution coming into um, it through the consultation. I will let Councillor Bai have a quick response to uh, Councillor Stockman's challenge, but then I plan to move on. You're being much kinder this evening than you were last week, so I'm, I'm warming to you again. <laughs> Councillor Stockman, two things. Firstly, I work Saturday afternoons as well as Saturday mornings. <laughs> I can, it, it, you know, Brixham is so popular, I'm that busy. The more serious point, in a nutshell, the previous strategy had a clear target of 615 homes. Your, your strategy, a clear target, so forget everything you've said, your strategy, the previous strategy, this administration signed up to a strategy with a target for 615. Is there anything that you see, anything that you've learned, anything that we found out in the last couple of years that sees that as being too high? We will leave that as an open-ended question to be answered um, at a later date. Um, assuming that the, the following um, contributors are talking about the consultation and the consultation document, um, uh, Councillor Foster, then Councillor Barron. Microphone. Uh, th uh, thank you, Chair. Um, my comment is similar to what Councillor Bai and uh, what Councillor Lewis have said. Uh, 1.2, the draft strategy in the introduction section, it talks about this is the strategy for the next 10 years. So my comments are around is um, that it, uh, I felt it lacked anything. What were you going to do in the, next, in, in the next six months? What was urgent? What was going to be done? It lacked what action was being done at the moment and what is going to be done. So I think it was at the end of the consultation, it's talking about an action plan. So I just hope that the action plan can include some action. Okay, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Foster. And I think as uh, Councillor Long previously um, responded, that there will be an action plan in response to the final draft um, following the consultation. Uh, Councillor Barron. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, my uh, question comment concerns page 106 and the, uh, the purchasing of up to 37 homes uh, for, temporary, for temporary accommodation. Um, having spoken to a number of families who have become homeless, um, I welcome the fact that that's, this action has been taken, and I'm sure that obviously we'd all like to, to be more than 37, but 37 is okay. I'd like to try and just understand a little bit more, because people will say to me, uh, who are in that position, how do I qualify? There's obviously 37 homes. There's potentially a lot more people who will need this temporary accommodation. Um, how will we go about, you know, prioritising cri the criteria for those that, that do qualify? Um, by definition, it's called temporary accommodations. So I just wonder how we will deal with people if they haven't managed to get on to permanent accommodation. You know, do we get into this cycle of, of people who have become homeless, been put into temporary accommodation and then been turfed out for the next temporary accommodation to come in, really. So just really trying to un uh, uh, understand that a little bit more. And, and the final point is really the, the power says, with the option to use these homes for longer term affordable rentals. So is this temporary accommodation just a temporary plan or is it a permanent plan? Thank you, Chairman. Tara, do you want to respond from the technical point of view, operational point of view? Yeah, certainly. So um, the accommodation is emergency, so it will be families um, that approach the service as being homeless tonight, as it were, so they've lost their accommodation for a number of reasons. 
main reason for people losing accommodation in Tor Bay at the moment is loss of private rented accommodation because landlords are selling properties um, and also can't afford the rents. So it's a whole system approach. Ultimately, it's about trying to prevent homelessness when people are selling properties. Obviously, that's very, very hard. But there may be also other mechanisms depending on, we've also mentioned domestic abuse, for instance, as one of those other reasons this evening. It's also then about enabling people to move out of that accommodation. So hopefully our stock of temporary accommodation is only of a certain size because we can limit the numbers going in and then enabling people to move into permanent homes. To move them into permanent homes, going back to the beginning of the conversation, is also then about making sure it's affordable for people. So it is part of a system. We need to stop the flow going in and then we need to enable people to move out as quickly as possible. So hopefully the, the resource that we've got on hand can therefore be recycled, if that makes sense. And maybe there'll be a day when we don't need it, and I will welcome that day when we don't need temporary accommodation for families, but in the interim, we do. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I don't have to say, I, thank you for those comments. Uh, I obviously wasn't trying to be critical about it, just trying to get an, a better understanding about it, because the number of families will come along and say, how do I get one of those 30, uh, how do I qualify for one of those 30 cents? So that's why I was asking, really. Also, the point is, I understand that there's a company buying the, the, these properties for us. Um, I hope that they will lean perhaps towards the properties that are, uh, are ready to move into rather than ones that need fixing up. Uh, that, I know that might seem a, a quite simplistic and oversimplistic question, but obviously if they don't need a lot of refurbing, then they can move in quicker. Uh, and I mean, if you look around the bay, there are a number of developments, you know, around the, you know, around the, the East Street area, for example, which there's properties that have been done, ready to move into and are not moving very quickly. So something like that could be a quick fix, you would say. It's just a suggestion, it's just a comment. Like I say, it's not meant to be in a negative way in any way at all. I'm just trying to sort of we want the best for people as, and as quickly as possible because they're in very distressing circumstances and it is terrible. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Long. And I think the, the whole reason we were buying these, the, these homes for temporary accommodation is that um, uh, the kind of hotel stroke B&B accommodation is not best for particularly families um, either and it's perhaps not as reliable as it perhaps once was uh, particularly at certain times of year uh, for people as well so and I think we are exploring with that company to see if we can separately buy um, uh, properties for social rent as well but that's at a very very early stage um, uh, but that's but that's being looked at as well thank you Councillor Law I was actually only going to come back to Councillor By. I think maybe the moment's gone, but um, I just wanted to reassure, and I wanted to bring it back to the consultation rather than the wider questions about strategies and things like that. But I wanted to assure you, Councillor By, that we would not lose our good rating simply because of housing. The Ofsted are very aware of the housing market and the situation more broadly. We are not magicians, and Ofsted never expect us to be magicians. What they would always require of us is to know that we're aware of that difficulty and that we have a way and a plan to move forward with this. This is part of this plan. You know me, I'd have, like you, far more about care leavers in it. There were originally five points put forward from um, the housing review. There is one point in this. And this strategy, I want to just reassure you, has gone to the service manager for our care care experience young people this afternoon for comment to the whole team because I, I feel it really important that they come come back and comment on that. Um, yeah, that was it. That's all. Thank you. Well done. Well, thank you, Cordelia. If there's no further debate, then I move to the vote. All those in favour? Unanimous, Chair. <laughs> Apologies for, to Councillor Long for not allowing him to sum up. Um, I'm sure you can make up for it on the next um, item, which is the further disposal of council-owned land at Hatchcan to enable housing. Yeah. Councillor Long. Thank you very much uh, indeed. Um, colleagues will rem remember that in September 2020, uh, that Cabinet and Council agreed to dispose of a strip of land at the Hatchcombe nursery site, uh, which is... Uh, in the Barton area to sanctuary housing at nil cost in order that some affordable homes could be built. Um, the, the land was disposed of at nil cost with the understanding that um, there would be 100% nomination rights from Torbay Council. Uh, 
This, of course, would have a uh, favourable uh, effect on other council budgets, such as uh, temporary accommodation, etc., which would outweigh a capital receipt. Um, I won't look at Martin while I'm saying that. Um, following um, some pre-application discussions, Sanctuary Housing um, revisited their design, and in particular the, the access. Uh, as a result of um, um, re rejigging their design, there was... Uh, uh, and an improved layout, more affordable homes can actually be built on that site. Um, the proposed new access um, traverses um, a piece of council land that was not within the original transfer of land. Um, so that the d decision before us today is to include that uh, piece of land in the transfer. The 100% nomination rights will continue and um, uh, after lobbying by local ward councillors, officers are also seeking to ensure that there will be a path from in the uh, a path from the properties to uh, the shops on Barton Hill Road. Um, delivering uh, this transom strip to sanctuary will ensure that the the, um, the the wider homes will be built. Um, and I'm pleased to, to see in the equality impact that there will be wheelchair access um, as part of some of the units uh, in that property, in those properties as well. The appendices show the maps of the original scheme uh, in September, September 2020 and the proposed new scheme as well. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Long. Um, and I'm happy to second this. Um, this um, disposal will actually, as Councillor Long um, explained, open up the site um, and I think it's another example of the way in which the relationship between the Council and our partners in terms of uh, registered providers has strengthened and improved um, in order that we can have that open conversation and recognise their need, their opportunity to increase the numbers, but it also benefits some of the residents in that area because the original access would have been troublesome, I believe, for um, one of, I think it was the cul-de-sac, I can't, yeah. can't remember the name of the cul-de-sac, um, Beachfield Place, something like that. Um, but so it really is an opportunity for us to work um, and support the development and delivery of housing uh, in that area as we've just been discussing. Uh, I'll open up to debate. No one from around the table, no one from around the room, no one in Etherworld. In that case, I'll move to the vote. All those in favour? Unanimous, Chair. Okay, uh, move on to item 10, uh, multifunction devices contract award approval. Um, Councillor Carter, um, would you like to put your proposal? Right, start again. Our contract for our supply for our multifunctional devices such as the printers, the copiers, scanners, etc., will expire in May 2023 next year. So we have completed a competition call-off on the Crown Commercial Services Framework to find the best value supplier for this equipment. We have now selected a supplier which will continue to provide the service for the staff with new, newer and more efficient devices, and this contract is now before you for approval. Just to remind you that most of this report is in part two, so if we stray into that, those restricted papers, we'll have to go into a part two. <coughs> the recommendation is on page 126, and is that the preferred supplier be awarded a contract for the provision of multifunctional devices across council estate for a fixed five-year term for the se from the 2nd of November 2022 until the 2nd of November 2027, as set out in the exempt Appendix 3. Thank you, Councillor Carter. Um, and I'm happy to second, and I've uh, not really got anything to add, um, other than the fact that it, this contract also has taken into account the reflect and reflect the changing nature of the way in which the Council operates, 
uh, with an increase in home working um, and change in te technology. Um, so um, I'm happy to second. Uh, open to debate. No cabinet colleagues. No one in the room. No virtual hands. In that case, I'll move to the vote. All those in favour? Unanimous, Chair. Okay, move on to item 11, which is the Highways Review Report of Overview and Scrutiny Board. Uh, Councillor Mori. Thanks, Chair. I don't, I don't need to, I don't think I need to, to, to go deeply into this as, as you have on pages 146 to 149, the responses to the comments from the uh, ONS Board. Uh, you have uh, our cabinet responses, which I would want to move that the cabinet's response to the highway review report of the overview and scrutiny board be approved and published. Um, I still moved. Okay. Do you have a seconder? I think it was going to be. Oh, it might be me. Councillor Law. <laughs> Sorry. Yes, Councillor Law. <laughs> Sorry, oh, I'm miles away there. So, yeah, although this, oh, what? Oh, him. <laughs> right, breathe, start again. So, although this is uh, just uh, to note, I'm very happy to second it. And um, I'd just like to take a quick opportunity here. Never want to miss a, an opportunity to get in there. So, um, just to highlight a couple of things. So, the road safety campaign, since this report was uh, produced has been launched officially um, it had a great launch in September at South Devon College Councillor Maury Councillor Carter and myself attended and there was excellent coverage you might have seen it on BBC Spotlight so the second thing I want to do in this opportunity is to encourage local communities and schools to get involved with our road safety campaign and uh, the vis vi right and you would be able to say this vision zero campaign stop laughing um, by becoming a community speed watch volunteer so you will see that the review noted that Torbay actually didn't have as many volunteers as other areas compared to other areas and the police and vision zero is, and, and us obviously are asking our communities to maybe get a bit more involved in taking responsibility for uh, speeding and road safety in in their areas and their communities and lastly I'd just like to mention operation snap so many people nowadays you have dash cams and all sorts of technology in your cars and operation snap makes use of the technology by enabling you to upload photographs and video of near misses or dangerous driving anything you see um, on the roads and up to and upload it to the police to take action and to date so far 4,300 cases have been pursued through this channel by Devon and Cornwall police and I think that's amazing bit of citizen participation which I'm all in favor of so if you want to get involved please just search operation snap or vision zero or get in touch with your local councillor who should be able to do point you in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Law. Um, any debate from Cabinet colleagues? Uh, I understand Councillor Lewis has his virtual hand up. Uh, thank you very much, Chairman. Uh, in the report, it states that there will be a parking review, and I'm speaking really with CPZs, uh, can the portfolio holder tell me when that parking review will be published and when the, C the changes or whatever in CPZs will be announced? Thank you. Yes, th th <coughs> thank you, uh, Chris, for the question. <coughs> I can say to you that I think similar to what was written by um, the Director of Place to you within a, a few weeks ago, that we will be starting the process of uh, of a policy, a new policy. It's, it won't come to the next meeting of the transportation park, uh, uh, pol um, parking working party, but it will indeed hopefully be in time for the new year. Thank you. Councillor Barron. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, it's Councillor Maury, really. Uh, I'm very pleased that the extra money was put into the road safety issues and that there was 
cross-party support on the discussion about Queensway, which was uh, still a, a very tragic accident out of a thankfully very small number. Uh, Councillor Moy, at the previous meeting, you did actually say that uh, you would be willing to meet with the parents of the of the unfortunate child. I just want to ask if that had actually happened. If not, is that offer still on the table? Thank you, Chairman. Well, as you know, with you present, I met with the mother at the ta at the original time back in beginning of the year, uh, and the comment I made at the transportation uh, working party still holds that if if mother or father does need to talk to us, we're here. Thank you, Chairman. I appreciate that reassurance from Councillor Moy. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Bai. You're hearing me now from the cheap seats, Mr Chairman. <laughs> <Welcome back. laughs> Councillor Law indicated just now that there is some safety initiative to improve safety in the vicinity of schools, and I was very, very pleased to hear that. Through you, I would like to invite her to come along to Ilsham Road, the Ilsham Primary School. It has been a concern for residents, pupils and parents, the chaotic nature and the absence of a crossing there. I have requested on numerous occasions a crossing and a safer crossing for children and residents in that area and I'm sorry to say I've got absolutely nowhere. So if you would like to join me one morning or one afternoon, please, please, and advise, advise how I can progress that. And I, I was not involved with, with this review. I'm, I'm vice chairman of Overview and Scrutiny, as you know. I was absent, I think, briefly um, for one of the meetings or the second, I think, two of the meetings. So I didn't participate. But I did actually ask for this review or suggested that this review be established. <laughs> And it's my concern of the culture and the lack of responsiveness and the difficulty in making progress on highways issues. So it's just not that there is issues uh, of potential danger on Ilsham Road. It's, it's the sort of brush off that you get. The computer says no when you make requests, reasonable requests on behalf of residents. So at the moment, I'm trying to get the white lines refreshed on the pedestrian crossing that we do have on the Babacombe Road. Some colleagues around the table will know this. A gentleman who was knocked down on Christmas Eve in 2020 spent that period in hospital, in, in his view lucky to be alive, absolutely wants me to make sure that that becomes a safer crossing, and at the very least all the markings, all the markings are refreshed. They're completely worn there now, and the lighting is poor. It's a crossing where I have felt uncomfortable. I made a question through the council's inquiry system on the 1st of August. I chased it up, when I went away on holiday at the beginning of September, still nothing. When I came back at the beginning of October, and I accept I had a long holiday, but don't I deserve it, there was still no response, you know, on a life and death matter. 10 weeks to get a response from highways who now say, oh, oh, we'll put it on a list. And yet that crossing, I believe, is dangerous. And white paint, for goodness sake, can't we get some white paint sorted out? It's the culture of our highways operation, I'm sorry to say. The lack of responsiveness to members. Please, 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 can there be a culture change in our highways department? I would say 10% maybe more of all inquiries I receive as a ward councillor in Wellswood are highways related and it is the one area where I get absolutely nowhere. Thank you, Councillor Bryan. I think um, your uh, feelings and frustrations around some of the highways related issues are uh, commonplace and I think and the Chief Executive is in the room virtually and I'm sure that she would have been picking up on those points, um, as will the director of place um, and other board members of Swisco. Um, I am aware that there has been, you know, like everything, a lot of our council departments are really, really hard pressed for, for staff and resources. Um, and that's been compounded by the recent departure of a senior officer, um, which doesn't help. But uh, um, Cordelia, you wanted to come in? Yeah, I'll happily take you up on that that offer, Councillor By. I was actually the first school my daughter went to when she went 
for infants in there and it's it's a horrendous crossing it really is because there are traffic comes from just been trying to think is it five different roads feed in within a, a short area it is a very difficult difficult area and I will more than happily come and, and, and see that with you as for um, there's often I often get a lot of inquiries from school about lollipop people but obviously that's now and with academies sorry Sorry, with academy, I thought I said the wrong word then. Um, with academies, it is the responsible of the academy. We provide the training and the uniform, but they have to employ the staff. Um, we were introducing the 20 mile an hour zone, as you know, in um, Barton and around many schools. And I think, I think I would support you in trying to, I think, I know I would support you, in trying to organise something better crossing there around, see what can be done around the Ilsham School because it is dangerous. I would also like to assure Councillor Barron that um, I am in contact with the parents of the young lady. However, I don't wish to put that out in the public or political arena, so I will. They do know and they are, have been involved at every step of the way in the creation of our road safety campaign. Thank you. You just did. <laughs> Thank you. I look forward to a date on Ilsham Road. Uh, uh, Councillor Barron, and then I'm going to move to the vote. Yes, sorry, Chair. I'd just like a bit of clarity for that. Uh, is there an implication that I'm trying to make something out of this that you're we're, not? We're, we're we're, sorry. We we're, we're move on to the vote um, if there's no other contributions from Cabinet Get colleagues. So, all those in favour, please show. Unanimous, Chair. Thank, thank you, colleagues. Um, we'll now move on to item 12, um, but because of the nature of this, I'm going to propose that we have to move into a private session, into part two. Um, do I have a seconder? I'm very happy to second. Thank you, Councillor Law. Um, all those in favour? Unanimous, okay. Chair. Um, at this point, um, given the time that I mean, the technicians need to uh, leave the room as well, and we need to check that the Zoom room is clear um, of public or press, um, and also the YouTube streaming will um, cease um, from this point as well. So thank you if you've been following on YouTube. But I also propose just to have a quick uh, five-minute comfort break um, before we go on to item 12. 